Hey, Dixie, welcome to the Keto Cam Podcast. Thank you so much, Ben. It is a true honor to be here. I am also honored that you came on the show. You have a brand new book that I have right here for those watching on YouTube. It's called The Nourishment Mindset. I'm a big fan of mindset. And we're going to take a deep dive into your book. And I got to give you uh, or a, a thank you. I should say thank you for connecting me with uh, Dr. Kate Shanahan to begin with a couple of years ago. You were the one who, who connected me to her. And she's been on my podcast three times since. So thank you oh. so much for the connection. Of my course. audience loves Dr. Kate. And I just want to say thank you right off the bat. Well, it's the least I can do for both of you. Her work literally changed my life, not only health-wise, but professionally. So um, there's that. And then just loving your work uh, to put y'all two together uh, for me was a, was a no-brainer. So, Well, thank you. Uh, I'm so glad that you did that. Let's talk about your backstory. In your book, you talk about your past, um, a fat ballerina with bulimia, essentially, is what you write about in the book. So I'd love for you to go back to that time and some of the the struggles you had, and it's very relatable to the struggles a lot of people might be having when they fall down that rabbit hole of what mainstream news or mainstream wisdom tells them what to consume when it comes to nutrition. So how, how was that for you back then? Well, it was hell then. Um, but because I was so ensconced in a severe eating disorder, I didn't know any different for a long time. So what that was, when I refer to the fat ballerina, I'm being facetious because at the time I was hovering under 100 pounds. But when I looked in the mirror, I saw a fat teenager because I wasn't thin enough. And what, the reason I point that out is because it's to show the way that disordered eating can change your brain functioning. Because I can look at a picture of myself now and go, oh my gosh, what a sick chick. But at the time, I didn't see, my mirror reflection was different than what reality was. So that's just to illustrate the profound effects that eating disorders have on the brain. So a little bit scary, but true. Um, and you know, the reason that I developed that eating disorder was in part, I think a large part due to ballet, but I don't want to blame ballet. I'm just a super determined person, and I didn't have the, the God-given gift of a ballet body, is how dancers talk, um, and I was hell-bent on getting it, and that's just me, for better or for worse. Also, my parents were in the middle of a horrible divorce, so I think, possibly, had I not had all those other life stressors, that maybe I wouldn't have gotten so sick, but I was completely consumed by this eating disorder. You, you didn't even realize you had an eating disorder, did you? Not really, because it's funny what you can tell yourself when you're trying to justify behavior. And at 15, you know, what do you really know anyway? I mean, it's, it's a tough place to be in, in in adolescence. But I just, I knew I wanted to be a dancer. And everyone around me basically had an eating disorder. So that just felt like that's part of the job description. And so that's like normal in my world. And I think a lot of people who are into gymnastics, ice skating, the wrestling for, for men, um, that's just kind of part of what you're signing up for. Mm, that's too bad. Uh, that's interesting. Um, you mentioned a quote in the book. I'm going to read it directly because I love the quote first time I've read it or heard it. Uh, from Marcel Prost. And uh, Marcel said, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. You kind of start off part one of the book, chapter one of that, with that quote. So what, what is, what, 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 how does that quote resonate with you? Well, man, that's a great question, right? Because I just talked about how I looked <laughs> in the mirror and I literally didn't see the image that was reality. So it's in part due to that, but when I put that in the book, that for me was really reflecting the transformation process that I went to to become completely healthy. Because I did recover from the eating disorder, but I still just kind of had dalliances with non-normal um, behaviors such as exercise, bulimia, and that sort of thing. But once, I met people 
met, in quotes, through their work, like Dr. Shanahan, who you mentioned through Deep Nutrition, um, who is totally focused on the four pillars of, uh, you know, the ancestral diet. She led me to think, oh my goodness, I've been doing this all wrong. You know, I haven't at all been thinking about the nutrients. I've just been thinking about the calories, you know? So gummy bears versus steak, which by the way, steak is high in fat, so I should be avoiding that. And then in walks in someone you just had on the show recently, Nina Teicholz, and her work. And it's like, oh my gosh, maybe I'm nutrient deficient. Maybe the reason I crave sugar all the time is because I'm not eating anything that's really bioavailable to my tissues and cells, and that I'm just hungry. And so between those two women, that, that is what transformed my mindset, and it gave me the, the new eyes uh, that uh, Marcel Proust's quote uh, reflects. Makes a lot of sense. And a lot of people have gone down that path of calories in versus calories out or might be on that path right now. And I would estimate that if I walk down South Beach here and I ask 100 people, how do you lose weight? 80 out of 100, maybe higher, will say, oh, just eat less and move more. Um, right. Which kind of makes sense, you know, but it doesn't give you the full picture. That's like, that's like asking somebody like a billionaire, how do you get rich? And he says, just spend less than you earn. You're kind of, <laughs> yeah, thinking, right. you're kind of thinking like, yeah, that makes sense, but it's not giving me the solution. There's a lot of things missing in that answer. So let's talk about it. Like, why is it such a, a failed approach and why does it disregard nutrition, uh, metabolism, hormones, and, and what can we do to put an end to that conversation once and for all? Right. So a wise person uh, once said, <laughs> you know, we don't need to count calories, but calories do count. So I have. I agree. I used to say, you know, just throw all the calories out the window. And frankly, that worked for me for a long time. But as we age, our bodies change. And I still don't count calories, just for the record. That would be like going back into just a zone I can't do. But. The point is, it's really the lens of nutrient density that matters. Like that's, and I do firmly believe that our, our bodies, our brains have, you know, we know this, you know, hunger and satiety signals. There are all kinds of things in the endocrine system, as you and much of your dedicated audience know, that influence your eating. Um, patterns and behavior, but I think that the missing piece that we see in sort of the world on both extremes, right? So on one extreme, which is not many people, but it's a spectrum, you've got people just like shoveling in fast food mindlessly watching the TV, like if anyone's ever seen the movie Idiocracy, like that's an extreme, yeah. it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very depressing. On the other extreme is like your, you know, fitness model or some of the, frankly, diet dogma people who, you know, I love the carnivore diet, for example, for, you know, certain people that has like saved lives and made such a, a, a wonderful impact on them. But when we start getting too dogmatic and we're now afraid of a sweet potato, neither of these extremes and a lot in that gray area in between like none of this reflects like to me the the beyond nutrient density is the pleasures of the table like we're supposed to enjoy our food we're supposed to enjoy our lives and we just that to me is the missing piece of the metabolic puzzle we're all talking about what should we eat and when should we eat and should we fast and yada yada but i think this leaves a lot of people out of the conversation because they're just it, they don't want it to be so hard. So mm -hmm. calories yeah. are just hard. It's math all day long. And mm -hmm. when you think more about nourishment and, and pleasure through nourishment, you're, to me, you're focused on something that's more sustainable and pleasurable. Yeah. And I don't like math, so I don't want to do yeah, it every day. <laughs> Please, no. And I, I agree. You know, the calories matter. I, I, I'm not denying that. They're for sure, calories matter, but are they important? No, they are very low on that uh, priority list. There are other things that are so important. You mentioned it, nourishment, um, the quality of your relationships that you sit down with and have food, right? When we think about blue zones, and there's a lot of pitfalls with blue zone populations, so I don't Indeed. put a lot of value in that, but what they have in common, 
those individuals have community, they have celebration, they have feast, they have nourishment meals, they, they enjoy each other's company. So that's what you're getting at, right? The quality of the relationships, how we actually, we're not just sitting and eating by ourselves in our car driving, we're actually sitting down, being present and enjoying the meal with the people around us and being present with them. Right, and I cannot prove this. I haven't done any studies. Boy, it would be fun to like study French people at a table and take some blood work <laughs> every <laughs> hour because they're there for many hours and just see yeah. what's going on under the hood metabolically. <laughs> but it, it's more of the experiences that I've had, um, not only abroad, but with uh, people who love food uh, in America as well. Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna. They actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's gonna cause you to sweat. And one method of flushing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And I, every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60 minute massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audiobook. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code. Bond Charge hooked you up. So head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your Bond Charge products. All right, let's get back to today's video. That would be interesting, right? As, as we see prior, their cortisol drop throughout yes. the meal. They're like it's for the hours <laughs> that they're there having their, their meals. And the you dopamine. Were in the book, I think, <laughs> yeah, dopamine, exactly. You were, um, you were in France, right? In the book, I remember reading about you living in France for some time, correct? So... Yes, I had a transformative experience in college just studying abroad. And I will admit, I not only brought a scale, a body scale, on my study abroad adventure, I brought a set of eight pound weights. So back to that, like, overly dedicated. <laughs> and I'm not proud of that, but I share that just to show, again, that mirror that you're looking into and you're not getting back what is reality. Um, but that's the first place I noticed. Like, oh my gosh, these people have a completely different relationship with food. A, B, you know, wow, I mean, how are they all so possibly thin, you know? Paris bitches. <laughs> like, <laughs> so that angry. was sort of the tip of the iceberg. And then through my prior career, I traveled a lot to France because I was in the wine industry. And so that's kind of the the heart of the wine industry. Uh, Italy would argue differently, um, and they can enjoy that argument. And then later, my family and I bought a share in a home in the south of France, so we're there yearly. And we spend a lot of time just like living there, not sightseeing or anything, just being around French people and their culture. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, you mentioned exercise, and I know the book talks a lot about exercise, and I mean, you're, you're, you're a fitness coach too, like you, you love I exercise. I am, but I do. But I, I, I know that you don't teach or do exercise for weight loss. You do it for other reasons. So explain why exercise is 
probably not the best idea if you're, if you're just doing it for weight loss. Right. And that's what, like, you know, I love to pick on big food, big pharma, but I also pick on big exercise, which is funny, right? Because I've spent on and off my teen and adult life working for gyms. <clears throat> I'm, as you said, I'm a fitness instructor. I love exercise. In fact, in my life, I've loved it too much. I've been an exercise bulimic, but that didn't come from a love of exercise. That came from wanting to burn calories. And it still drives me insane when I walk into places where I teach and I hear an instructor before me talk about, look at all those calories we burned. And it's like, no, <laughs> I have conversations like this every week with people. Exercise is a poor way to lose weight. I mean, frankly, when I used to teach triathlon or coach triathlon, I should say, I saw plenty of people gain weight. How do you gain weight training for a triathlon? Well, there's bad nutrition advice, and then you have hunger signals uh, that get increased. So I think just same thing as like rethinking our approach to food and how we nourish ourselves, rethinking the, the approach to exercise. You know, there's so many benefits to exercise. My favorite one, which, I mean, you know, but big exercise ain't selling this one, is, you know, improved insulin sensitivity. Yeah. That's awesome, you know, but I can't like hop on the scale and see that. That's under the hood. Got to get your blood work done, and it's not going to happen overnight. So as a former 20-year marketer, I get why, the, why they're touting and marketing that burn calories, but exercise for me is more about insulin sensitivity, increased sleep, increased mood. There was, I'm sure you saw this, the study that recently came out that in the last two weeks talking about how exercise is better um, been shown to be better than medication for certain mental health conditions. Yeah. You know, the strength, balance, I mean, that's huge as we age. There's so many benefits, but just thinking I'm going to start going to the gym and lose weight, like, you're going to be disappointed, and then you're not going to exercise mm -hmm. because it, quote, yeah. didn't work. Yeah, and, and to your point, there's a difference between losing fat and losing weight. You could be actually breaking down muscle if you're doing too much cardio or excessive exercise. And I, too, well, you know, I used to be a fitness coach. Not anymore. I used to be a personal trainer. I used to own a CrossFit gym. And I remember being really diligent with the whole calories in versus calories out. I was probably exercise bulimic, like you referred to. I didn't even realize it, but probably was. And it's a lie. When somebody tells you you burn 500 calories from that, CrossFit workout or that Orange Theory workout. No, you didn't, uh, first of all, because if you just sat on your butt, you would have probably burned, I don't know, 350 <laughs> calories. So you really burned 150. It, it's a Good lie. Good point. More burn. math. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. More math. And we're probably getting away from like the true point here. But I just want to point out that it is a lie. Like your watch that says you burn 800 calories with that 10 mile run. It's not true. That's that's showing you what you would have burned with your basal metabolic rate sitting on the couch plus the additional calories burned. So it's really just the quarter of it. And I say all that because it's just a math distraction. The human body is not a math equation or a calculator or a bank account. It's a very complex, amazing chemistry lab. And we need to stop treating it like a calculator and start treating it like a beautiful creation that it is. So I'm glad that you saw the light. I saw the light. And uh, you're calling true. out big exercise. I love that you're doing that. Well, and then hopefully that changes the relationship with exercise. I mean, I feel like we're both, I'm grateful for the fact that I actually enjoy it. I, I'm going to assume you do if you owned a gym, <laughs> but yeah. you know, not everyone has that. Um, but part of that I think is because it's like this thing I have to do that I don't enjoy that I'm just doing to burn calories. But if as you know, if you can find something that you love that brings you joy, hopefully outside for the free vitamin D, now you're just getting pleasure from it. it it's actually a nice experience. And the, the other thing I dislike with big exercise is this idea that you have to go somewhere and stay there X amount of time. Like, to me, that holds a lot of people back. Like, a 10 minute walk is awesome. Do that every day. You, that's a big math equation. <laughs> it's a big number over a year. <laughs> and do it after you eat, even better, right? Um, mm. You're right about the, the exercise part. A lot of people are like, they, they look at it like, I'm going to go suffer just to burn those calories. And that's not going to, that's going to be very fleeting. It's not going to last very long. But if you could, you, if you could find, we'll call it a hobby, something that you enjoy doing that also incorporates movement and exercise, like that is such a winning formula. For me, it's basketball. Every Sunday, sometimes even 
in between like yesterday i went to the park but every sunday for sure i go play basketball and yeah i'm burning a ton of calories i'm getting all these steps i'm getting my heart rate up and i'm getting all these benefits but i don't feel like oh, i just exercised for an hour and i'm like exhausted or or like oh i'm gonna go exercise for an hour to burn. i i feel like this is fun so that yeah. could be pickleball that could be i don't know surfing could be swimming but finding something you enjoy to do that's also an activity of movement that is the sweet spot and that's exactly what you're saying right Absolutely. And something I just thought of is to ask you is whenever you're out playing basketball on Sunday, do you do you have it? And as soon as you hit 500 calories, you go, I'm done. Yeah. Peace. Yeah, We're right in the ring. middle. <laughs> ring. Oh, 500 calories. I'm out, guys. I'm done. Because that's what people do <laughs> on the stupid. treadmills, the yeah. gerbil mills, I like to call them. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> And look, and I'm, all, I'm not against treadmills. I'm all, I love sprinting and warming up on it, but I'm not doing it to hit a 500 calorie threshold and hopping off, right? right? That's your point. So yeah, that's a big power tip right there. Find an activity you enjoy, that you love doing. You'll get the oxytocin benefits, do mm. the dopamine benefits, and the exercise benefits without actually realizing you're exercising. So great tip right there. Um, I wanna talk, uh, I wanna transition here, because your mission, I love the mission, a metabolic mission to help people achieve vitality. When it's a great mission, I love it. I love that you're clear on the vision, on the mission and the vision. When did that become clear to you? Like, at what point during throughout your journey did you decide this is the mission, and and why? Did, how did that occur, and then why is this your mission? Over time, um, I'm not shy about the fact that I started writing the book when my son was a toddler and he's now nine and it's just published and the funny part of that story is really that i remember after i wrote the first draft i'm like what do all these authors complain about i'm done with this sucker in six months and now you know seven years later okay <laughs> eat your words bad pun um <laughs> so the meta to get back to the metabolic mission you know it's this is more uh, this is more personal to me so when i read those books by dr kate and nina and others. I was just in a kind of a tough place in my life because I had a career that I loved, but I was kind of pudgy and I wasn't really working out. And I was just kind of, I wouldn't even call it depression, like that's a label, but just not really my vibrant self. And again, through them, I experienced this vitality and realized, ooh, I think I was malnourished, which is kind of funny. You know, at the time I was working in the food industry, how could you, you know, high end culinary, I should say, how can you be malnourished in that space? Mm -hmm. But it's because of the choices that I was making. And so because I was able to achieve vitality and just feel good, I mean, to me, that's the bottom line. I mean, it's great. Someone wants to fit in a pair of pants, lose X amount of pounds, but to me, ultimately, it's about feeling your best, waking up ready to enjoy your day. You call it, uh, I believe, vitamin G. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> it's hard to have vitamin G when you're struggling metabolically because mm -hmm. you just don't feel good. And mm -hmm. so once I realized, like, oh, that's what it's about, like, I feel so much better, then I realized I've got to close the marketing agency that I've been pouring my heart and soul into because I've, I, I must share this information with anyone who will listen. I want to help others. So that's why it's a metabolic mission, because I know there are people out there that are struggling and they're, they're doing all the, in quotes, right things. And... They, you know, the average person does something like 50 diets in their lifetime. I mean, that's brutal. That's a brutal way to live. And I just, it doesn't have to be that hard. That was my key takeaway. Like, we can achieve vitality. We can reverse chronic lifestyle conditions by focusing on, as you know, the real whole foods, but my little addition is the pleasures of the table. Like I want it to be fun, just like we talked about with exercise, because then it is something that brings you joy, and so you want to do it, and I just, I haven't, um, all my life, it was not fun. And, and even in working in the wine and culinary industry, I would not eat like the steak because of the fat content. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am dining with farmers and chefs and winemakers all over the world. Everyone around me is having a blast. 
And I'm literally counting the calories in my head as I'm sitting there pretending to pay attention to the conversation. <laughs> oh my gosh. So that's not fun. You know, that's, that's not being present. I think being present is such a key part of enjoying life. And I just was never present because I was focused on other things. Yeah. And that in this day and age, it's becoming even more uh, challenging to be present. It reminds me of a quote from, from Neville Goddard. He said this like in 1950 something. He said, we are only, po- we are only, uh, what did he say? We are only limited by weakness of attention and poverty of imagination, right? So weakness Oof. of attention is that right there. It's like, we are being distracted purposefully from advertisements, TV, social media, um, junk, crap information. And it's, creating weakness of attention. So lack of present of being present and being uh, fulfilled and being grateful. And then poverty of imagination is just the, the stinking thinking that I call it, like the negative thought. So he believes that's the only thing we're limited by weakness of, of attention and poverty of imagination. So you're essentially hitting upon both of that by saying to be more present. Yes. Yeah. To enjoy again, if you're counting calories or worried about how you're going to burn it off after you're not present. And that goes against the big exercise, the fitness influencers who uh, don't teach that. They're not teaching you to be present. They're not teaching you about metabolic health. They're teaching you, hey, if Skittles fits your macros, then go for it (laughs) on your Skittles. (laughs) And then enjoy the glucose roller coaster ride. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, but you're in a calorie deficit, uh, so you're winning. That's that's their mindset, which is, it's just so shallow. Nobody Nobody goes from counting calories to, to focusing on metabolic health back to counting calories, right? I, I can safely no. say I've never heard that before. Um, people go from counting calories to metabolic health like us, but we don't go back. Like once you see the light, it's like I, nobody goes the other direction. Because oh, I can't see the truth. Right. I just, it's like, it's absurd to think about just going the other direction, right? There are things that I think need to be tweaked. And that's something that's been maybe a little discouraging to me because I never want to sit on like health coach Hill and look down at the masses. Of course, of course yeah. You were talking with, I believe it's it Dr. Annie, is it Horman recently? Yeah, Dr. Amy Horneman. Yeah. Horneman, thank you. Yeah. Um, who I admire as well. And as I have moved into the middle age space, um, and been, frankly, I mean, I, I, I had this hypothesis before, but after listening to y'all, like, just the, I need, my key takeaway from that recent one, which was terrific, was keto flex. I need, I, I will be <laughs> buying your book because I've been, mm, I hate, I mean, I hate to admit it, but perhaps a little too dogmatic the last year about being in nutritional ketosis. And frankly, my thyroid has suffered. And I'll just throw this out there because I'm a pretty open book. Who knew? I just got diagnosed with low T. I'm like, am I a dude? Why do I have low T? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a it thing. Happens. So, yeah. you know, what worked for me in my mid-30s and early 40s, I, I've got to change it up a bit. So I'm, I'm open to, to change. And that's where I think we have to just be open and shy away from diet dogma. Yeah. Uh, amen. I love that about you. Thank you for being authentic and transparent there. And that's what it's about. It's about health over dogma. And I do think based off of what you shared, I do think having a keto flex day, whether that's like one day per, per week where you have higher healthy carbs, limit your fasting and just feast it up, high protein, high carbs. Uh, it'll make some hormonal conversions that could help with the thyroid, help with the, potentially the testosterone as well. So I'm curious if you do do that and you see an improvement, you let me know because I would be curious. Oh, I will. There. I will. <laughs> I'm going to have to embrace that sweet potato. <laughs> oh. I never really thought a sweet potato was a problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's more just the mindset of, okay, what's worked for a long time isn't working anymore. So we got to change it up. we got to experiment and just be open to new approaches. And, and that's okay. Yeah. And, you know, just to piggyback, you know, to share with like transparency, one of my challenges over the years has been putting on muscle. Mm. It's been something. And when I was doing my CrossFit days, I was putting on muscle, but I was overtraining. So yeah, my was. hormones were, were tanking. So that's not the way I want to put on muscle. I want to put on the right way. And then the last two years has been a delicate balance between like being consistent in the gym and, and strength training 
and some lower back issues I, I've been having over the last oh. couple of years. And then also like fine tuning the protein intake and all that. So that has been my challenge the last couple of years. But I'm happy to report that the last month or so, I've been seeing a new chiropractor and she's been doing some more like trigger point release on my lower back and it's been feeling better. So I've been getting into a consistent routine and then I've been upping the protein and the creatine. So my experiment is to keep doing that and see what it does for the muscle mass. Because as you both, you know, and I know that we both know that muscle mass is such an important organ to develop and we want to have healthy amounts of it. I want to take a minute to share something with you as we take a break from the video you're watching. You know, one of the most common things I see to why people don't have enough energy levels, they have trouble building lean muscle mass, they have brain fog, fatigue, and they don't feel good is because of a deficiency in a hormone called testosterone. Now, testosterone is a very important hormone to have in a healthy amount for both men and for women. So how do you reclaim your vitality? How do you reclaim this very important fat burning and muscle building hormone, well, you can do it with a powerful supplement called Upgraded T. It has been my go-to for naturally elevating testosterone levels. Upgraded T is from Upgraded Formulas, and it contains the highest quality of ingredients that have been proven scientifically to increase testosterone production. Now, as I mentioned, if you're a woman watching this, this is very important for you just as a man watching this right now. Upgraded tea is a natural and safe way to boost testosterone levels. When you boost testosterone levels, it's going to increase your sex drive, vitality. It could help replace fatigue with all-day energy. It'll help you lose that stubborn belly fat. Uh, testosterone is required for fat burning, so it'll help you with the last 5 to 10 pounds that you're looking to lose. It helps you be in a better mood, helps with your memory and focus. So here's the three-step approach. Step one. Take two capsules of upgraded tea with water every morning. It does not break your fast. You can have it with food or without food. Step number two, notice your energy levels and dominate your day with more confidence and more vitality. Step number three, wake up the next day having better sleep and just keep doing what you're doing. As simple as that. So if you want to get your hands on upgraded formulas, upgraded tea, and any of their awesome products like their upgraded magnesium and their hair mineral analysis testing kit, Head over to UpgradedFormulas.com, and if you use the coupon code KETOSIS at checkout, they're going to give you 15% off your entire order. That is UpgradedFormulas.com, KETOSIS at checkout. We're going to drop that link down below, and let's get back to today's video. Yes, because when we diet, we, if we have that mentality, we often will lose muscle mass, and then it just makes the whole thing harder. Again and again. By the way, when you said, what did you say, trigger point? Is that a code word for like her digging it, him or her digging into you and you like biting your hand? <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. With your elbow and yes. uh, red light therapy. Yeah. I've had that with a physical therapist. He had what I called like an ice pick. I'm just like, oh, it's the ice pick. Yes. It's coming out. But you know, the things we do. <laughs> And it, and it, it helped. It's been helping oh, me. Yeah. And I've, I've been, Absolutely. and I've done other things over the last couple of years. And this is the thing that has helped me the most. I've done chiropractic adjustments, which I'm still for. I've done PRP injections and different stretching Ooh. and different things. And it wasn't until I found this lady and she's right like five minutes from where I live. What a blessing that she said, I know your problem. It's not that you need chiropractic adjustments or more injections or any of those stretches that you've been doing. Thank goodness. You have calcium built up in your lower back and we got to go in there and dig in and break it up and send it to your fashion. I'm like, okay, let's try it. And yeah, an hour of like her digging in, I'm like, they're sweating, you know, the feeling, right. but I get sore and then my body recover, like repairs and then I feel better. And it's like, Oh, oh that, that is awesome. Like so far. Yeah. Yeah. So thank God for that. Cause now I could be in a consistent routine, but enough about me. Um, you, uh, you mentioned Nina Ty Schultz and Dr. K. Shanahan, who, pretty cool, they, they endorsed your book. And those were two people that actually, like, you started studying and influenced you to get into this space. So how, how does that feel for those two rock stars to, to endorse your work? It is, uh, it's still a little bit like a dream, quite frankly. Um, because I worked for 20 years in PR and marketing, I, you know, I can joke around and say that's sort of professional stalking. So I was not shy about uh, approaching them, but not to help me. I mean, I approached them years ago to thank them because when someone has a work that improves your life, you know, of course you want to let them know that. And it turns out that both of them are 
they're human beings. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm not into celebrities, but to me, they are my celebrities. So to, yeah. to have them endorse my work, just, I mean, they're, it's, it's hard to find the words. Um, and I, I really, I appreciate those ladies very much. I, I tried to give back to them uh, when I was still in my marketing role. My idea was, look, I'm in the food and wine industry. You know, a lot of people in the industry, you know, they want their cake and eat it too, to use a horrible <laughs> expression. But, you know, people there want to enjoy life, enjoy the pleasures of the table. But a lot of them are struggling just like other people. And so to me, if I can bring the work of Dr. Shanahan and Nina to a broader audience that writes about the pleasures of the table, then maybe we can all benefit. And we had some, um, I think, good success for each of them. You were, uh, you know, one of those. But we also had a lot of pushback. I ain't gonna lie. Um, and, How so? Well, you were talking with Nina about um, people pushing back oh, on the her, bullying? the bullying. Oh, that's what you were mentioning in the I email was, you sent me. Yeah, yeah, I was never bullied personally for promoting her work, but I do have an example. I had a, and I'm not going to mention this person's name, but I had a long time um, connection colleague. I've done many pieces with her who wrote for a big, you know, what we PR people would call an A-plus publication. And she got Nina's book. She inhaled it like I did. She wrote this whole feature piece after interviewing her. We were all three of us so excited. It's going to come out. And then just one day, poof, story got pulled. And I'd huh. never had that happen with this writer. With others, wow. sometimes, pretty rare in that industry, uh, just gone. So you and I both know. I mean, it's it's what y'all were talking about. So yeah, big big pharma and big food does not want that article published. No. How, long, <laughs> how long ago was that? When was that? This was probably three four years ago. Because that was one of my ways of thanking Nina. Hey, can I volunteer for the Nutrition Coalition? May I promote your work to a different audience? You know, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how we we did that. But. I just wanted to circle back on that because it's true. I mean, the, sometimes the mainstream ignores uh, what we need to know that can best help us. Yeah. Yeah. Not only do they ignore it, they intentionally give us the <laughs> opposite of what we should be doing. So I was just at um, Low Carb Denver and I was moderating a panel. Ah, yes. That's a great with one. Doc yeah. Doctor, uh, on the panel was um, Dr. Ken Berry, Nadia Padaguana. Um, who else was there? Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, Dr. Jamie Seaman, and Dr. Quadwo. Quad oh, I love and him. Oh, his yeah, personality. He's, he's great. <laughs> yeah, he's so much fun. And one of the questions that the audience asked was, like, how do you, how do you cut, cut through all the noise when you see, especially like Tufts University or the Ugh. food, my plate food or food pyramid, all the stuff, all the iterations, mainstream news talk about, like, this is how you should be eating and how it's completely different than what we teach in our space. Like, how do you cut through that? How do you, this, like, how do you decipher all of the confusion, all the noise out there? And what I said, and it got a big laugh from the audience, I said, well, I think it's very valuable to follow what the government is teaching when it comes to nutrition. Like, I pay close attention to it. I tell my students to pay, pay close attention to it because I want to know what they're promoting. And then once I know, I'm going to do the complete opposite and I know <laughs> yeah. it's going to be healthy, right? <laughs> so that's what I would recommend to people. Just do the complete opposite, the George Costanza effect, and you're going to go down the right path. Well, and thanks to George Costanza, people could appreciate that and they, you know, <laughs> yeah. get it. In my book, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not too nice <laughs> to that. Uh, I call it the uh, POS food pyramid. Keep the language piece of something food pyramid and uh yeah uh, it, it's just it one needs to know and then one can decide for oneself <laughs> what is working so i want to talk about chapter 23 okay how to heal your addicted brain and you have several tips here but i, I i'm going to start with the first one because i think this is very important not just if you have an addictive brain but just for health but you talk about ditch the, the screen rise I like that. I actually never heard that term before. Screen, before screen rise. I don't think it's and, mine, but I borrowed it. 
<laughs> I like it though. Screen rise. Oh, that sounds awful. And then rock your morning. So why is that so important to start your day off the right track with uh, being intentional with your morning routine? Well, I'm going to go back to something I've heard you say about vitamin G. You know, if we wake up in bed and just start running through, oh my gosh, I got to do this, I got to do that. Uh, you know, that just turns on <clears throat> hormones. I, I think cortisol would be the number one. And that's, you know, would you like to be awakened by someone saying, you know, as I say to my son, rise and shine, Fletcher? Or would you like someone to be like, get out of bed, we got a shitload of stuff to do, let's go, go. You know, it's like the army, right? <laughs> like, um, so to me, how you start your day is almost a blueprint for how the day is going to go. And we are sure. all, and I, again, I'm not on Health Coach Hill looking down at people. I struggle with this too. But I think when you, you don't, screen rise is just what it sounds like. It's, you know, a lot of people have their phone indented into their face when they wake up. You know, so my pro tip is don't put your phone in your bedroom, right? Then you can't have a phone face indent. And you also, it's harder to do screen rise. And so I think, you know, I'm not one for like hard rules because then I just want to break them. But I do see the benefit of leaving the phone outside of the bedroom, putting it on airplane mode, and then not turning to that. So think about like the approach to your day. So I wake up. I don't want that drill sergeant yelling at me. How nice would it be to just walk outside of my door and look at the sunrise or whatever is going on? Maybe you wake up early and you're seeing the, the stars in the sky. You're taking a few breaths. Um, I have some PT exercises for my neck that I do like a weirdo on my lawn. I'm barefoot, right? That way I'm a, a, a source of amusement for my neighbors. But why am I doing that? I'm grounding my feet in nature. I'm just taking a few minutes before the onslaught of the day comes to also just, again, vitamin G, be grateful. I woke up today. You know, I, I'm grateful for that. This is going to be, you know, I'm going to intentionally live this day. And I'm going to also, a big one for me is being gracious um, to, to remind myself to seek the best in other people because I think we all have a tendency oh that guy cut me off or whatever it is like it, just to have a mindset to begin the day it's what like us yoga instructors would say set your intention for your practice <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. set your intention for your day and you're not going to get it by looking at your cell phone yeah yeah well said it's so I, I do exactly what you said i put my phone on airplane mode cool. at night keep it out of the bedroom and, and that's also important for emf purpose purposes yes. too and then i don't look at my i don't turn on my i don't take it off of airplane mode until probably an hour after i wake up so i go through my whole routine of writing down my goals practicing gratitude taking my dog for a walk doing some tony robbins uh, priming exercises and then boom then i'm ready to start my day as i make my coffee i turn on the phone, listen to like a podcast or an audio book. And it, it's been transformative for me because before many, many years ago, I used to be one of those people who did, um, what was it called? Screen, screen rise. rising, I would screen rise. And I would actually every morning, just first thing. And it's like playing Russian roulette because you can look at your phone first thing in the morning and you might get a nice text or comment on your social media, which is cool. Good dopamine hit. Yeah. Or something negative or a problem you have to solve and it's like boom you're scrambling that cortisol is through the roof the drill sergeant yelling at you go get started on your day and that's just not a i don't want to play that game so i love that you put that in the book thank you you also have in here embrace environmental discomfort so mm -hmm. we'll talk about that why is that in here well <laughs> you know it a lot of us, and I, I work against this. So I, like you, I live in Florida. Like, it's never cold. You know, it gets to be 40 degrees and we're all throwing on snow jackets. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So the whole point of this is, you know, we live comfortably. And I'm not discounting people that are struggling. But in general, in our culture, you know, we've either got heat or air conditioning. We have fluffy mattresses and, 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 and pillows that are customized to our neck and whatnot. And then, you know, we have a climate-controlled office and a climate-controlled car to get there, or we work in our climate-controlled homes. 
maybe we go exercise in an air conditioned gym. I mean, it's just always, uh, there's never, I mean, there might be mental discomfort, but when I say environmental discomfort, I mean physical discomfort. So exercise, which we've talked about, is a great form of physical discomfort. And I'm not saying to press it to the point of injury, but there are other ways to do that. Um, my favorite, Frank, is cold showers. I'm a huge fan of Wim Hof. I love that dude. Um, and it's funny. It's actually, and I still, I'm not, I'm not good at it. I still scream like a baby every time I step into the cold shower and who and ha, you know, my, my husband is weird wife, health coach, what <laughs> happened to her, but oh is my god, Is it getting cold though? Because you're, you're in South Florida. Does it I get am. cold? Yeah, it can get cold way? if yeah. you put it all the way. You can't. You got to wait for it to get a little bit cold. I still think it saves water for waiting for it to heat up, especially for people in cold climates. You got to wait a little bit for it to get cold. And it's probably not as cold as Wim would like it. But it still elicits the, like, hooing and yep. hawing from me. And I get a little rush from that. I ain't going to lie. It's sort of like Wim Hof's um, breath holding technique you know that's environmental discomfort as your co2 is rising you you don't like it um but gosh i mean it's it's like free endorphins and us exercise lovers like we we kind of like our endorphins so there's many ways to embrace environmental discomfort again i've talked about how my neighbors think i'm weird like if it's one of those rare cold days in florida like i don't bother putting on a jacket and i go walk around barefoot walk the dogs like i just it's super invigorating for me. So yeah, I love it. It's you know, hormesis. Is what you're yes, talking hormesis, about. Like, uh, and it's not my positive. idea. <laughs> yeah, positive stress. The uh, the body adapts. The mitochondria adapts, and they get stronger and better. And that's the name of the game. People think stress is bad for you, and it can be if your body does not adapt to the stress. But stress could be. It's very important for health and resiliency and longevity. So cold showers are a stress to the body. Intermittent fasting, which you talk about in the book, is a stress to the body. Exercise, stress to the body. Red light therapy, sauna, are those bad? Maybe if you do too much, but if you do the right amount, your body adapts and you get stronger. So it's stress is only bad when you don't adapt to it. Stress is very vitally important when you do adapt to it, and that's exactly what you're referring to. Precisely. And it's fun to like hoot and holler in the shower. I ain't gonna lie. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there's something about it. Like, I got this. The other thing I like, I, I didn't, I don't know, that, I don't think I mentioned this in the book, but I realized something. I, I try to do something difficult every day within the first hour of the morning, something that challenges me, I guess physically. It's usually something on a yoga mat or with breathing. And the reason, I, I realized this recently after I'd written the book, like, if I can put myself into a yoga bind or do my favorite pose, bird of paradise, which got your leg up by your ear, and it's a crazy pose, right? If I can do that and just sort of embrace that discomfort, then I am able to deal with child, dog, <laughs> clients, schools, people who honk, you know, because I already did something hard that day. So I just, for me, it just sets my mindset up to be just, I'm going to, because I'm type A, right? I've always tried to be type B plus. I don't think I'll ever get to a B, but just to calm down and be like, I got this. Like, I don't need to attack everything. It's a great tip. Start with something hard in the morning and the rest of your day becomes easier. I love that. Thank you. What is your, with the book, uh, the nourishment mindset. What was your fav What is your favorite part, personally? Your favorite part about your book? Oh, <laughs> great question. <laughs> okay, I could go in a few directions, but I think my biggest pet peeve. Like I love the ending because it's just hippy dippy and it's weird. But I think my favorite chapter to write was the one I called CPS, Cholesterol Paranoia Syndrome. Because that just, we Southerners say, that just burns me up. And I tried to have fun with it, but the fact is there are so many people walking around with side effects, taking statins that are 
you know, the number, as you know, number needed to treat is insane. I'm not saying statins should go away, but there are also people who propose statinating the water in certain countries. Um, and as someone who is, you know, food is medicine, um, I, I just, you know, and it's not my place. I'm not a prescribing provider, but every time I see like a woman of my age, for example, I tend to work with middle-aged women just because I am one, um, and she's on a statin, I just, I cringe, right? It, it, so it, yeah. it's, I try to have fun with the chapter and I kind of laugh, you know, CPS, because I have a story in there about this eye doctor I went to. I, um, I went in because I had blur vision in one eye and we still don't know what the heck caused that, but thankfully it went away. But here I am thinking, you know, am I going blind? Am I having a stroke? That's, you know, I'm going to the ER because I think I'm having a stroke. And this ophthalmologist who has a very good background, nice guy, totally thing, before he, you know, he's looking at my chart and the first thing he says to me is, have you ever been told that you have high cholesterol? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> am I having a stroke? Like, can we get to the statin talk later? You know, that's a real thing in an emergency room. Like, it's just, it's such a pigeonholed uh, approach in the medical field. And again, I'm not, I'm not a provider. I'm not saying you shouldn't take your statin, but I'm just saying, you know, like weighing the benefits and the risks. So I think my hope, that's, that's why it's my favorite. I hope someone can just say, look, there's a whole nother story to this. Cause I think a lot of people are swallowing these pills just for insurance, you know, in quotes. So I don't have yes. a heart attack, but this is all the diet heart hypothesis. So I'm going to hush up because I could go on forever about this clearly, <laughs> but that's yeah, no, the one. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you 100%. Where is the best place for the keto campers listening and watching to get your book? Oh, thank you. So there are two good places, and it just kind of depends on what the keto campers want. Um, the main place is Amazon. Everyone's heard of that, so just the nourishment mindset, or you can put in my name. I just have one book, so it's not. there's going to be a lot of confusion there, Dixie Huey. Or if someone wants a signed copy, like sometimes people will do this for a gift um, for someone if they, they've read the book or they think it could help someone or if they just want a signed copy. Um, my website is Favor Fat, F-A-V-O-R, Fat, F-A-T. No surprise what that means. Um, and, and I'll do a signed copy. And guess what, y'all? I compete with Amazon. I, I offer free shipping. Wow. To that. that. So either way, whatever style you want, that those two options are there. Awesome. So either Amazon or if you want a signed copy from Dixie, favorfat.com. It's a great name. Thank you. Last question is about vitamin G. You mentioned gratitude. Um, I'm going to ask you right now, what are you grateful for? What's your vitamin G dosage today? <sighs> I love it. Um, I must tell you before I answer that question that I, I did attribute this to you, but I use that in my yoga classes this week because listening to your oh, wow. episode with Nina, I was That's like, so oh, cool. I love this. I love it. Um, so yes, but I did not steal it as my own. So vitamin G for me, I'm going to make it a little bit broad. Um, there are many things for which I'm grateful, but I'm just grateful to feel vital. I feel better at 45 certainly than I did at 15 when I was a hot mess at 25 when I had all the like bounty of youth and, and was a competitive triathlete like is it still I know that I could have done better and then at 35 just struggling really starting to see the effect of malnourishment and disordered eating so like I, I just I'm glad because I feel like in middle age a lot of people and I'm also I'm grateful that I don't take medication Mm. And, and I feel great and I wake up every day and I'm just ready to, to ground my feet and rock and roll after that. So thank you. Yeah. And then, you know, weird out your neighbors. I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Provide yeah. neighborhood entertainment. <laughs> the hippie on the front porch strikes again. <laughs> yeah. There she goes again. Dixie. What a weirdo. I love that you do that. So yeah, that's great. Um, kudos to you. You live it to lead it. I'm so glad that was part of your journey to get nourished and then create a book. Thank so you. your next book will probably come out in nine more years. So stay yeah, safe. right. I mean, <laughs> I'll be looking at fifty-five. We'll see how I'm doing. <laughs> uh, anywhere else that your social media, any any social media you want to promote for them to follow? Sure. If you're someone who likes Instagram, it's Nourishment Mindset. 
I'm a weirdo and I took myself off Facebook for various reasons, so you can't find me there. I'm probably the only person not on Facebook. Um, I'm on LinkedIn at Dixie Huey, and um, I do have my podcast, which is favorfat.substack.com, and also a related YouTube channel to that if people would prefer to watch. I'm getting ready to do some strength training um, videos, so those will be on YouTube oh, cool. in the next couple of weeks. 15 minutes to a stronger, leaner you. That sounds great. Yeah, so go, go subscribe to Dixie's YouTube. It's Favor Fat on YouTube. Uh, I love that. Well, Dixie, thank you for writing the book. I'm so glad that I got my copy thank and uh, it's out into the world. And you're helping people get take ownership, and that's what it's all about. You know, you're empowering them with the right info, inspiring them to take ownership, and that's the starting point for great change is when people take ownership. So, thank you for helping people achieve that, and thank you for coming on the show and your support. And uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. So, thank you so much, Dixie. My absolute pleasure. I really appreciate your well-formulated, thought-out questions and just the work you do. I, I always learn something when I listen to Keto Camp. I love it. Thank you, Dixie. We'll do round two right. in Marco Ireland.